How you doing guys? Welcome to another video. This is still topic one, which is stoichiometric relationships, and we're still on 1.1, introduction to matter and chemical change. Let's go. All right, 1.1, finishing up matter and chemical change. In this one, we need to look at writing chemical equations, applying state symbols, and then looking at some changes of state. So the IB applications and skills that we'll cover is looking at writing a chemical reaction, looking at applying our state symbols, and then explaining some of the changes in physical and chemical reactions. So some more practice with writing ionic formulas, and this was covered in the first video. If you need to go have a look at that, go and check it out um, to get a bit of an idea, because I'm going to run through these really quickly. Use your periodic table or your valencies that have been given to you by your teacher. So lithium and fluoride, they go together nicely because they're 1 plus and 1 minus. So this, the formula is LIF. Barium oxide. Barium is 2 plus. Oxide is 2 minus. So again, they go together nicely. BAO. No need for brackets. No need for numbers. Sodium oxide is the first one where we need to include a little 2 because we need two sodiums. Now sodium is a single atom it was a single atom, it's an ion, so we don't need to use brackets, so it's Na2O. Chromium with a little funny three next to it means it's a chromium three plus ion, and nitrate is a polyatomic ion with the formula NO3 minus. Now we do have a problem here, we've got three chromiums and only one nitrate for the charge, so I need three nitrates to balance the charge on the chromium, which means I need to include brackets and I need to have the three there as well. Vanadium with a V, that means vanadium 5. So we have V5 plus and sulfide is S2 minus. So there's no easy way to do this one, but we can apply the little trick, which is swap the charges. So we would have V2 and then S5. Yes, that is a 5. It looks like an S, but it's a 5. Sodium dichromate. Dichromate is one that you'll have to remember. Cr2 O7 2 minus. So we need two sodiums to balance out the charge on the dichromate. So it's Na2 Cr2 O7. Okay, so what is a chemical equation? A chemical equation is a basic tool for chemists that describes what happens during a chemical reaction. A chemical reaction always has reactants and products and it might contain some special conditions if required. So we have our reactants on the left and we have our goes to arrow our, and our products on the right. So our reactants go to our products. If we have any special conditions, they would go on top of the arrow. So photosynthesis, for example, requires UV light. UV light is a special condition, so it would go there. So in our reactants, we also have our state symbols and they symbolize if something is a solid, a liquid, a gas or aqueous. In IB chemistry, we always need to write the state symbols with any reaction that is written. So here's an example. Solutions of iron 2 nitrate and sodium hydroxide are mixed to form a precipitate of iron 2 hydroxide and sodium nitrate. So I've highlighted the reactants in yellow and the products in green. So we've just got to get the formulas right. So iron 2 nitrate would be Fe. NO32 because the iron has two plus charge and the nitrate has a minus charge. It's a solution which means it's aqueous. The formula for sodium hydroxide would be NaOH and again it's a solution so it's aqueous. Then we have our goes to arrow. Now iron hydroxide is one of our products. Its formula would be Fe bracket OH2 and then it's said that it's a precipitate which means it's a solid. Our other part of the products is sodium nitrate, which is NaNO3. And I forgot to balance this one, so you should quickly go through and balance it, silly me. Now, if we need to apply the state symbols to all of the equations, then we need to know what they mean. So the state symbols are always in brackets and they're always after the chemical. Now the reactants and products in a chemical equation can always be in one of four states. They can be solids, which are pretty easy to visualize because we've worked with solids a lot. They could be a powder or they could be bigger chunks. A liquid. Well, liquids are something that we're quite familiar with, but in chemical terms, a liquid is pure. So the, most of the things that we'll deal with will actually be aqueous, and there's not many pure liquids. Some of the ones that you might deal with, is water, 
pure water or deionized water or any water that you use will be a liquid. Other things that might be liquids would be like if they say 100% pure ethanol, for example, that would be a liquid. Or if you're using one particular type of oil, that would be a liquid. Gases, gases are pretty self-explanatory. We know what a gas is. Most of the time we're familiar with it. So things like CO2 and O2, they would be expressed as gases. Aqueous is the one that we might not be as familiar with. And that means an aqueous solution. So an aqueous solution means that we've taken something and dissolved it in a solvent, usually water. We've usually dissolved it in water. So ionic compounds, for instance, are always solids. They're found as solids. But then to turn them into a solution, what we go and do is we add them into water and that forms an aqueous solution. So for example, table salt, NaCl, when it's added to water, it breaks apart into its ions. So the Na and the Cl break away from each other to form sodium ions, which are aqueous, and chloride ions that are aqueous. This is called dissociation. We've dissociated the ions. Now these ions are now separate. They're not attached to each other anymore and they're surrounded by water molecules. The surrounded by water molecules means it's an aqueous solution. So here's a couple more examples where we need to apply the state symbols and balance the equations as well. A solution of calcium chloride is added to a solution of lithium carbonate. A white precipitate of calcium carbonate is formed. So again, I've tried to put the reactants in the yellow and the products in the green. So we've got to get the formulas right. CaCl2, it's a solution, so it's aqueous. Plus lithium carbonate, Li2CO3 aqueous, goes to calcium carbonate, CaCO3. They said that's a precipitate, so that's solid. But we must have something else. We've got some things left over that we've got to account for. So what's left over? Well, it's a lithium and a chlorine. Now lithium is only Li plus and chlorine is Li minus, so the formula is just LiCl. Because we've got more than one on the left hand side, we've got to balance that by putting a two in front of the lithium chloride. And then that's a balanced chemical formula. A solution of barium chloride is added to a solution of sodium sulfate. Write the balanced chemical equation. So here we have barium chloride, BaCl2, aqueous. We've added that to sodium sulfate, Na2SO4, aqueous. And what's going to happen here is the ions, the positive in chemical one, is going to be attracted to the negative in chemical two. So they're kind of going to swap over. And I've kind of tried to do that with the green and the yellow. So the barium is going to be attracted to the sulfate and the sodium is going to be attracted to the chlorine, giving us our two products, BaSO4, which is in fact a precipitate, and then we are left with NaCl, sodium chloride, which we would need to balance because we don't have enough sodiums on the right hand side. So BaSO4 is a precipitate because it would form a solid and settle to the bottom of the test tube. We will look at the solubility rules in a following uh, topic, but it's also a good idea to look back over your year 10 uh, work and have a look at those things that are insoluble. Okay, physical and chemical change. A physical change is something that is reversible. So whatever we do to the substance, we can reverse it and get back what we started with. So the easiest way to think about this is something like ice. Ice is just water that has been frozen. So we're working with this solidified water. If we heat it up, we can turn it into liquid water. And then if we heat it up even more, we can turn it into steam. Now, if I can collect the steam, I can cool it down, get the water back, and then I can cool it down further and turn it back into ice. So that's a reversible change. A chemical reaction is a non-reversible change. So for instance, a cake. Once we get the cake mixture, we mix it all up. When we put it in the oven, it turns into a cake. But no matter what I do, I can't get the eggs, the flour, and the sugar, and everything else back after I've put it in the oven. So that's a chemical change, and it cannot be reversed. So what are the signs that a chemical reaction has occurred? Well, some of the signs are we could have a change in color. The color of the substance could change. We could see bubbles being formed, which would be a gas. A precipitate would form, which is when we add two solutions and we form a solid. Perhaps heat was released, so we might get something that gets hot, 
or something that gets cold. That could be a sign of a chemical reaction. And then another sign is that new products are formed. Okay, let's dig down into these physical changes a little bit more and talk about changes of state. So if we have a solid and we melt it, that's called melting, it turns into a liquid. If we get a liquid and heat it up, we have boiling and evaporation. Evaporation happens below the boiling point. And then if we have a gas, we can turn that into a liquid by condensation and a liquid into a solid by freezing. If we have a solid and we want to turn that into a gas, that is called sublimation. And a gas going straight to a solid is known as deposition. But the one thing here, if I need to go from a solid to a gas, I need to add energy. If I need to go from a gas to a solid, I need to remove energy. Gases have lots of energy and solids have very little energy. So we can think about changing these states as either adding energy or removing energy. Now an exothermic reaction is a process where heat is released. So that is the energy or the heat is lost. We need to get rid of the energy. Endothermic is a process that absorbs energy. So that's gaining heat or heat or gaining energy. So if we have a look at some of these changes, if we got carbon dioxide as a solid and we turn it into carbon dioxide as a gas, then what kind of process would that be? Exothermic or endothermic? Well, I've got to add energy in. So that must be an endothermic process. It must take energy for us to turn carbon dioxide as a solid to carbon dioxide as a gas. If I've got NH3 gas and I want to turn it into a liquid, well, it's got to undergo condensation. So that means it's got to release energy. It's got to get rid of some of the energy. The only way a chemical can get rid of energy is if it's an exothermic reaction. It's releasing the energy, which will then cool it down to form the liquid. The final one, if we have water as a liquid and we want to turn that into water as a gas, well, the only way we can do that is really heating it up. So if we're heating it up, that means it's endothermic. It's absorbing the energy and turning it into a gas. All right, topic one, 1, 1.1, volume two, some top tips. Make sure you practice your formula writing and make sure you include states on all chemical reactions all the way through your course. Thanks for watching, guys. Don't forget, drop a like on the video, subscribe for more, and I'll see you next time.